this one. Oh, the agenda. It's this one. Do you have one? If I could have everyone um, find their chair. I'm Rob Sutherland, the director of the Canadian Centre for Behavioural Neuroscience at the University of Lethbridge. To begin, I wish to recognize that our event is taking place on traditional Blackfoot land, part of Treaty 7. 
It's my pleasure to welcome to this event friends and relatives from Blackfoot and other First Nations, Métis, and Inuit communities. And we welcome any contributions from their traditions and cultures to this event. This is the final event in the annual Brain Awareness Week, during which we've hosted a series of talks for the university and wider communities, and our annual open house this morning at CCBM. At the outset, I'd like to acknowledge special guests we have. Um, Dr. Erasmus Okine, Vice President of Research at the University of Lethbridge, who would like to offer a few words. Wow. <laughs> this is just wonderful to have all of you here in this wonderful place. My name is Erasmus Okine. I'm the Vice President of Research, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's keynote address and the panel discussion. As Rob said, as Dr. Sutherland said, the University of Lethbridge acknowledges that we are gathered on the lands of the Blackfoot people of the Canadian Plains and pays respect to the Blackfoot people past, present, and future while recognizing and respecting their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationships to the land. The University of Lethbridge is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. I'm pleased to see so many familiar faces, researchers, students, and community partners, and I'm looking forward to meeting some of you that I've not met before. Thank you for taking the time to join us today. This afternoon's presentation and the following discussion are part of the Brain Awareness Week, a global event with the goal of increasing public awareness of the progress and benefits of brain research. I am sure, as many of you already are aware, the University of Lethbridge is a leader in the brain research, home to the Canadian Centre of Behavioural Neuroscience and an incredible group of faculty, researchers and students working in this field. This week represents an opportunity to showcase the work this group is doing and how we at the University of Lethbridge are helping to address some of the biggest healthcare challenges of the 21st century. I, as Vice President of Research, am very proud of the brain research taking place on our campus. And as you will hear today, the work of this distinguished group of people is already having a positive impact on the future health of our society. But this does not happen in isolation. We are lucky to be part of such a vibrant and supportive community. And your presence here today demonstrates the supportive community that we have. And that supportive community extends well beyond the borders of our campus to include individuals and organizations throughout Southern Alberta and across Canada. Groups like the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and Northwest Territories who have joined us today are important partners in advancing research and serving the needs of communities both locally and abroad. I would like to thank the Alzheimer's Society for their support of today's event and their ongoing commitment to the Alzheimer's Research Program. Let's give them a hand. I will also like to recognize and thank students, faculty, and staff showcasing their work here today. And I encourage all of you to engage our students, our faculty, and in terms of discussion, ask them tough questions before you leave. Thanks again to all of you for being here, and I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Have a great day. Thank you.
I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Dr. Kevin Keogh, who's currently the executive director of the Alberta Prion Research Institute, and notably past president and CEO of the Alberta Heritage Foundation for Medical Research. Um, Kevin will be participating in our panel, but um, he'd like to make a few remarks at the beginning. Thank you very much, Rob, and thank you all for being here. This I echo uh, Erasmus's uh, uh, comment about wow. Uh, we have worked over the last 10 years of talking about diseases like Alzheimer's and prion diseases in the communities around Alberta. The biggest audience has always been in Lethbridge, but you have about doubled the biggest one we've had before, so I'm delighted to see you here. I just wanted to say a word or two about the Alberta Prion Research Institute uh, because uh, we support a lot of Alzheimer's research. We were originally created because of mad cow disease and the problems that it created. But some very smart people when uh, the, the creation of the institute was made 12 years ago, no, 14 years ago now, realized that the nature of the diseases, prion diseases, and likely Alzheimer's diseases and related diseases looked like they would probably be very similar. It turns out that those people were quite prescient and they actually gave us a mandate to study other diseases besides animal diseases. And so for quite some time we have been supporting Alzheimer's research and related research and for the last six years, we've been doing that in partnership with the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and the Northwest Territories, where we equally support research on Alzheimer's disease. Uh, we're delighted to be able to do that. I'm also delighted to tell you from my days at AHFMR that the Canadian Center for Behavioral Neurosciences is the best in the country. It's an Alberta gem. <laughs> Most Albertans, most, even most people at the University of Lethbridge don't know this. <laughs> but if you ask a behavioral neuroscience they, scientist, they will immediately tell you that. It's a, it's, a, a, it's a great place. You should take great pride in it. And recently, I've been delighted that some of the young Turks that they've recently hired have been taking money away from the uh, Alberta Prion Research Institute to invest in their research. And they're here today, sitting at the table over here with Erasmus, so you, again, should chase them down and ask them what they're doing, because they're doing really, really interesting work. I wanted to leave you with one last word, and that is that the government of Alberta funds this Alberta Prion Research Institute on contract in five-year dollops. And the most recent dollop is about to run out. So if the government doesn't choose to provide more funding for this, what has been a remarkable run of research in Alberta is going to run out. I don't normally deliver this message, but I think it's timely that I do it. And I would ask you, if you think that what you hear today is important, to remind your MLAs whomever they may be after a month's time, because uh, rumor has it we may have an election call next week, that this is a really important and successful Alberta investment, and they probably should keep it up. Enough for me now, Ron. We should hear from Jay. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Kevin. And um, I'll point out that uh, after the main talk today, there will be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions of a panel of uh, people who volunteered to participate in question and answer series. Um, and in addition, um, there's an opportunity to submit written questions here to my left, um, if you would prefer to do that rather than getting up and using a microphone uh, after the talk. Also, there is um, 
a little card uh, that you can indicate if you're interested in contributing to uh, Alzheimer's research. It's our great pleasure today to acknowledge that we have one of Canada's treasures in science communication, Jay Ingram. Uh, Jay's a very popular science broadcaster, best-selling author, and public speaker. Probably most of us know him through his co-hosting The Daily Planet, which was a daily science TV program, which he co-hosted, I think, for 16 years. Um, he was host of CBC's um, Quirks and Quarks for 13 more years, and for two years, he hosted a CBC radio series all about the brain. He's authored more than a dozen books, several won awards, and several were placed on bestseller lists. I also note that Jay has received numerous awards for his activities promoting science and public understanding of science, including the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal, and in 2009, he was named to the Order of Canada. Today, he'll be speaking to us about Alzheimer's disease, a topic that, that should be a focus of our major concern. It's probably one of two major challenges for our generation. The number of people with Alzheimer's disease will double in the next 20 years, and the costs will triple over the same period of time. I can't think of any more important topic for us to talk about today, and join me in welcoming Jay to deliver his talk. Wow. I mean, I had to say wow. Everybody else has. Um, but uh, it, this is an impressive crowd. I'm going to warn you, though, I'm going to talk a lot longer than everybody has so far. And um, I want to make two points uh, before I start. One is, I'm going to be talking about the science of Alzheimer's. And in doing so, I don't want to give you the impression that I don't think, that I think that caregiving isn't important, that building uh, dementia-friendly facilities isn't important. They are, and they're becoming increasingly so based on the numbers, as Rob said. Uh, that's one thing. But I'm going to talk about the science because uh, that's how we're going to get to better treatments. And I think given that probably most of us, is that me getting too close to a speaker? No, okay. Uh, most of us know somebody, a loved one, a friend, an acquaintance, a colleague, whatever. Are we going to be able to stop that somehow? Okay, are we all right? Yeah, thanks. Sorry about that. Um, I just think it's very important that we understand more about it as citizens. And to that point, as citizens, there is a caution, and that is there's a flood of research being doing, done around the world on Alzheimer's. That's a good thing. There's growing interest in Alzheimer's. That's also a good thing. But one of the downsides of that is that you can go online and find out just about anything you want to hear about the disease. And a lot of it is bogus and wrong. You know, if you read about a case where somebody's dementia was reversed, that's not true. So you really do have, to, part of this is a, a joint responsibility of all of us. We have to um, exercise our critical thinking skills and if a claim is made that seems outrageous and novel, but very tempting, you have to check it out. So with that, let me tell you what I'm going to be talking about. I think that in a group like this, uh, most of us have three questions about Alzheimer's. Am I going to get it? If, if, what can I do to prevent that? And if I do get it, what happens then? So I'm going to address those questions, but I'm going to give you a little bit of the history of the disease as well, because I think it partially explains why we're 
maybe not quite as advanced in our research and treatments as we'd like to be. So, let's see how this works. And it's not working. There we go, sorry, my fault. Okay, that's um, Alois Alzheimer himself. He was a German scientist, lived at the turn of the 19th, 20th century. He was both uh, very skilled with the microscope, but also was a clinician, so he interviewed many of his patients. His first, uh, or at least most famous patient, was this woman. Her name was Auguste de Terre. She came to him uh, in 1901. She was 51 years old, and she already had dementia. So she had very early dementia. Um, you can actually read the transcripts of his interviews with her online, and they're, they're quite heartrending because she's clearly confused and lost and anxious. Alzheimer uh, stayed in touch with her for five years. She died in 1906. And then he had her brain, he from moved from Frankfurt to Munich by that point, had her brain sent so that he could study it. I'm going to show you some of the original Alzheimer's slides, microscope slides, that he made from her brain. But, to, but first, just to give you a sense, to be able to look at human brain tissue in a standard desktop lab tabletop microscope, you have to slice the brain ex exceedingly thinly so that light can actually pass through it. And when Alzheimer did that with Auguste Terre's brain, this was the kind of scene he saw. Now, it looks like a set of blotches and meaning meaningless squiggles, but to an expert like Alzheimer, some things stood out about this. These black patches, there's one on the left there, there's one to its right there, and one to the upper right there. Those shouldn't be in normal brain tissue. He called them plaques. They appeared to be aggregates of material that, as I say, outside brain cells that shouldn't be there. But it wasn't just plaques. There were also these smaller, I don't know, you call them tadpole-shaped or flame-shaped objects. There's one there, one there. They're also abnormal. He called those tangles. And they appeared to be inside brain cells or the remnants of brain cells. So Alzheimer concluded his study of uh, Augusta Terre by saying four things. She had dementia, her brain had shrunk, she had plaques in her brain, she had tangles in her brain. Today, 115 years later, 110 years later, plaques and tangles are still the main diagnostic feature of Alzheimer's disease. So even though perhaps strangely to us in the 21st century, not much attention was paid to Alzheimer's report on Auguste de Terre. Um, nevertheless, the disease acquired his name. But then for a great part of the 20th century, up until I would say the mid-1970s, there wasn't much medical attention given to dementia. There are several reasons. Um, when I was a kid, which was a long time ago, um, if somebody started to show signs of dementia, that was not seen as anything unusual or even medical. That was old age. Um, my favorite phrase is, oh, Aunt Mabel's gone dotty. <laughs> See, and it always gets a laugh. I, <laughs> but Aunt Mabel was going dotty, but it wasn't, that wasn't normal old age. That was a dementia of some kind. But for through the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, and even most of the 60s, either it was not considered, like you wouldn't take Aunt Mabel to the doctor because she couldn't remember things. That was just part of life. There were other theories. Uh, uh, an accumulation of small blood clots in the brain. That was a favorite theory in the 1940s and early 50s. It's not completely wrong but it's a only part of the picture. There are even uh, psychosocial theories 
Um, some people argued that mandatory retirement for men brought on social isolation, which is not completely wrong for dementia either, but brought on this isolation and then they acquired dementia. And it's, um, when you look at it from the point of view of today, that's a kind of an odd thing to choose because in the 30s and 40s, mandatory retirement would have been 99% men. And yet more women get Alzheimer's than men. So how was it, because they weren't retiring, how come they were getting it as often or more often? Then in the mid-1970s, everything turned around. There was a, an editorial in a neurology journal where the author just said, for too long, we have not seen this as a disease. It's killing people, it's probably killing Americans, uh, fourth or fifth highest rate of death. It's a disease, we know that plaques and tangles exist, they should be investigated more, and that had a huge influence. But there were also some social influences that turned people's, people like us, turned their attention to it. And one concerned, sorry, I'm going backwards again, that's been my fault, this woman, uh, Rita Hayworth. She was a fantastic actress, dancer, pin-up girl in World War II, um, a huge, a megastar. And, and just to uh, make that point, this is a video of her dancing with Fred Astaire. She was a star, there's no doubt about it. In the 1970s, she was living in a co-op apartment in Manhattan, and the, her, the other people living in the co-op wanted to kick her out because she was drunk all the time. And it turned out she wasn't drunk, she had Alzheimer's. And this case caused a stir in Manhattan, uh, caused a huge fuss across the United States. And at almost the same time, the advice columnist, Dear Abby, received a letter from somebody who had signed it, Concerned. And Concerned wrote to Dear Abby, um, I've heard about this Alzheimer's disease, but I don't really know anything about it. Where can I find out more? And Abby wrote back and said, the Alzheimer's Society has just begun in New York. Here's their address. Ask them. 20,000 letters. Then it turned out later the, it's the Alzheimer's Society that actually wrote the letter <laughs> called Concerned. <laughs> but those two events, you know, they may, it, people don't often think that science moves um, by public opinion like that, but those two really lit a flame under the whole idea of what Alzheimer's is and what we should do about it. And I just want to correct one myth that I think a lot of people hold, which is that it's somehow a weird epidemic that 100 years ago we never had this Alzheimer's disease and now, as Rob said, we have incredibly large in Canada probably pushing 800,000 people. What's going on? It's not an epidemic. It's, un it's undoubtedly always been around, but it is a disease of old age. And what do we have today that we didn't have 100 years ago? Many more people living past 65 that's one part, and a much larger population around the world from which to draw a segment of the population that's over 65. So here's, um, sorry, sorry Rita. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is a graph of life expectancy from a variety of countries starting in 1840 and going to the present. It is a straight line up. And if you do the math, it's about one year for every, f life expectancy goes up one year for every four years that pass. So my dad was born in 1909. His life expectancy at birth was 52. He lived to 98, but <laughs> the expectancy was 52. Of his cohort, that was the average expectancy. My son was born in 1992. His life expectancy is in the mid was in the mid 70s when he was born. 
one year for every four years that pass. And if you actually break that down, it means that a baby born in Lethbridge today will live five minutes longer than a baby that was born yesterday. <laughs> now, we're talking averages, okay? So <laughs> it's not actually going to happen, but it's worth thinking about every five minutes that you live. Make it worthwhile. Okay. <laughs> and just to, uh, sorry, I, I'm not good at this slide advancer, but I will destroy it apparently. There we go. Just one more graph to uh, emphasize what I just said about life expectancy. This is a graph of hun the number of 100-year-olds in Sweden and Japan because they have the best records. Um, up until about 1950, the line was virtually flat. Now there are uh, the, the top, the, t the 10 oldest people in the world right now who are all women uh, are all over 160. And the record, record was 122, although it's now in dispute because they think there was a birth certificate gone wrong. Okay, let's get to those questions. Will I get it? The reason most people worry about this is that it's somewhere in their family. A great aunt, an uncle, a father, a mother, grandmother. But it really depends when their Alzheimer's, and there are other dementias, which we might get into at the panel, but I'm going to stick with Alzheimer's. When it appeared, if you, were, if, if you know somebody who was Auguste de Terre's age when she w got dementia, 51, that is more than likely early onset, and most cases of early onset are familial. There are at least, there are three genes that have been unambiguously identified as not just raising the risk for that, but causing it. If you get the gene, one of these three early onset genes, you will get early onset Alzheimer's disease. Now, early onset refers to about one or 1.2% 1 of all Alzheimer's cases. So in that one sense, it's, it's not as large a medical issue as late onset, which is all the rest, on the other hand, it, it obviously creates ethical difficulties and dilemmas for people, and I've met some, who know that their mother has the gene and she already has, she, she has early onset and she's been tested and she has the gene, and these three young people that I met, all in their late 20s, early 30s, were then faced with the dilemma of getting the test. Get the test, you know, and it's positive, you know you're going to get it. It's a difficult question that has haunted uh, Huntington's disease and others for a long time. Late onset, and my mother got Alzheimer's when she was probably, probably first started showing signs in, in her early or mid-80s, is a completely different genetic picture. I should say that I mentioned at the very beginning, the volume of research right now is astounding, so almost it's almost likely that anything I say today, next month, might be a little bit different because the number of genes that raise your risk for late onset is growing. Right now, most of them are not very consequential, but may tip the scales a little bit. But there is a set of genes that confer a risk, a higher risk of late onset Alzheimer's but they do not dictate that you're going to get it. So it's quite possible I could have inherited the worst version of these genes from my mother. My dad could have had it too and just was, didn't um, affect him because he probably had a better gene to pair with it. It might raise my risk 10% or something like that. But on the other hand, even if I have two bad genes, I might never get dementia. So it's a completely different picture. And if your great aunt got Alzheimer's when she was 80 years old, my advice would be, don't worry about it. I mean, really, the most immediate impact you have to look at is your parents. But it's a very, very important thing, I, I think, to communicate that having an elevated risk can be dealt with to a certain degree. So the will I get it in terms of genetics is that picture. Early onset could be late onset, it raises your risk and maybe not that much. 
All right, um, that does bring me directly to the second question. What can you do to mitigate your odds? Uh, this is a complex question as well, because uh, the research is ever-changing. But the medical journal, The Lancet, tried to collate all of the, these other influences in your life that might help you reduce your odds. And uh, I'm sorry, these are very boring slides, but the only way I can show them well is just print. So let's say you inherit some of those late onset genes. On average, that might raise your risk 7%. But note, education, at least at this time two years ago, was estimated to actually lower your risk by 8%. Education is a fascinating piece of this because it almost goes lockstep with how far you went in school. So grade 8 graduation, you have certain risk. Got to the end of high school, less risk. Finished an undergrad degree, less risk, and so on. It's it's pretty astounding, not only because it's been borne out in study after study after study, but it's also fascinating because it all happens before you're 25 years old. And so some influence at that time is having its effect over the arc of your life. Um, Rob and I were just talking earlier about how more recent research is suggesting that it's not just education, but it might just be intelligence as tested even when kids are 15 years old. And of course, there's probably a correlation. If you're doing well in school, you might be tempted to go on further in school. So it's not that intelligence and education are completely separable. But um, this will it'll lead to, a, I'm sure, an inevitable question. Well, what if I did leave school after high school? What can I do about it now? other than going back to high school. <laughs> and uh, I think that it's fair to say that right now that you know everybody does Sudoku and does the New York Times crossword puzzle and watches good TV. I know it's hard, but you can find it somewhere. Uh, and, and hopes that that is the equivalent to education. But the definitive research that shows that, that confirms that you can do this kind of educational catch-up uh, isn't in yet. I think it'll come, but it's not there yet. When you get to midlife, uh, I was um, highly distressed to see that hearing loss, because I wear hearing aids, uh, is actually a greater risk than genetics. This is a very new finding, um, and it's not even clear why. It could be well, it could be several things, but it could, it's probably one of two things. Either hearing loss is an early, early sign of Alzheimer's, just like losing your sense of smell is, or it's the social isolation that it brings on. Um, we don't have time today for me to uh, go into my anti-hearing aid rant, um, but I'm, when I did Quirks and Quarks in the 1980s, I was doing interviews about how hearing aid companies are putting all their efforts into making them invisible, and none of those efforts, or very few of them, into improving the actual technology to let you hear better. <laughs> and uh, I can also attest to the social isolation. You know, I've got a smartphone with a whole bunch of hearing aid programs, and I can change them around, but the fact is that at a conference table with people at the other end, it's hard to hear, and once it's hard to hear, you lose interest in trying. It's, it's straightforward. High blood pressure in midlife, 2%. That may not be relevant once you get older. High blood pressure may not be as important. And I've highlighted obesity because in midlife, it appears to be a risk factor for Alzheimer's, but in late life, it might actually be an advantage. Now, it's sort of hard to control your body weight like that. I'm gonna stay thin until I'm 60, and then I'm just gonna let it go. Uh, but, and, and you know, so I have to confess, this is a it's, a, it's a bit of a problem for me getting up in front of a bunch of you and saying, okay, here's what's right and here's what's wrong, because it's a very shifting kind of situation. However, that's the case in midlife. Uh, late life, it's pretty uh, certain that all of these are super important, but, you know, 
it's a little, it's hard to control depression if you have depression. It's a medical issue in and of itself. But, um, well, what can I say about smoking? Uh, physical inactivity and social isolation, two really important things that I think most of us can take measures toward accomplishing and diabetes 1%. Now, here's the thing, that if you add up all of these small percentages of factors that will mitigate your risk, they can outweigh the genetic risk, at least again, of late onset Alzheimer's that you might have acquired. So I think, is the news good? You know, the, it's hard to find really good news around Alzheimer's, but I think taking these seriously as much as possible uh, offers, <laughs> offers a window of opportunity. Um, things to avoid, uh, brain injury definitely predisposes you to dementia later in life. Um, and so do general anesthetics. Um, we were talking earlier about a friend of mine who's a neuroscientist who's had both hips replaced with an epidural and really good headphones and a blindfold. <laughs> but uh, several, you know, obviously if you're in a medical situation where a general anesthetic is demanded, of course, you're not going to refuse it and just take the bullet between the teeth or whatever they used to do, um, you know, in, in case you might be risking dementia, but it, it is a factor. And things to do. <laughs> Fortunately, these are things we like to do. Um, sleep, I think it's mostly, well, pe people who have dementia have disturbed sleep quite often, and animal experiments have shown pretty clearly so far that uh, rats, at least, who are uh, genetically altered to be predisposed to developing the rat version of Alzheimer's, um, actually appear when they're sleeping to be flushing those plaques out of their brains. So I think it's, and you know, there are many other reasons. Um, food, we could talk about food all afternoon, but I'm not going to do that. But I will just say that there is a diet called the MIND diet, which is a bit like the Mediterranean diet. It's actually even less restrictive than the Mediterranean diet. But you know the old story, um, lots of fruit, lots of vegetables, seeds, um, uh, fish, not too much red meat. Oh, so scary to say that in Alberta. <laughs> Didn't do Katie Lang any good, that's for sure. Uh, but lots of vegetables. So, you know, here's a, th I mean, along with some of those other things like physical exercise, this is straightforward and not just good for lowering your risk of dementia, but for all other health issues as well. And, Mushrooms. This was just published out of the University of Singapore just uh, a couple of days ago that people with mild cognitive impairment, MCI, which is often a prelude to Alzheimer's, um, had their uh, the decline, their co cognitive decline slowed by eating a lot of mushrooms. Okay, and then if I do get it, what then? So this is not a pretty picture right now, and I think everybody has to be upfront and admit that, at least in terms of treatment. So you can get, uh, have drugs like Aricept that will delay cognitive decline for perhaps nine months to a year. It doesn't work much longer for most people. But in terms of actual treatments for what is thought to be the physical cause in the brain of the disease, and I would include particularly plaques and tangles in that, there really isn't anything. And the last 10 years have been a very disappointing scene for clinical trials for drugs designed either to break up plaques in the brain or reduce the number of plaques in the brain. And uh, I think the result of that has been a slow development of some thinking, well, maybe it's not plaques and tangles that we should be worried about. Maybe we should look at other things. Inflammation happens in the brain. Maybe that's the critical factor. I'll talk about a, uh, another one a little later. But I want to try and give you a sense of where this whole controversy is heading. Because still, most people believe strongly, I think most is fair, that plaques and tangles are the issue. Uh, this graph reads from left to right going from 
normal, cognitively normal, all the way to dementia on the right. And I uh, just want to call your attention, so it's a timeline. The red line is the increase in the number of plaques in the brain. And you can see that it starts rising when the individual is cognitively normal. So you would see nothing in their behavior that would lead you to think that dementia is coming. In fact, the tangles, the next line, the blue line, also starts to rise. And by the time both hit that first vertical dotted line, right above the words clinical do disease stage, the plaques have almost to topped out and the tangles are well on their way to doing that. And yet, at the first dotted line, the one in the middle of the slide, that person is not as asymptomatic. They don't even have mild cognitive impairment yet. Then you get uh, other stages, actual um, dis brain damage as brain cells and their connections get broken down and brain cells die. And then memory is the purple line, that's the fourth one from the left. But the real point is, that people are asymptomatic, they got plaques and tangles growing like crazy, increasing in number and cra like crazy in the brain. So, for those who believe that we're still on the right track and thinking about plaques and tangles as the cause, they will say, we just don't give the drugs early enough. Like, if this is the course of the disease, let's give the drugs way over there to the left where the person is normal. But how do you do that? They're normal. How do you know that they're going to go through this series of changes? That's why there's been so much focus uh, on things called biomarkers now. Can you trace, can you trace the early development before a person shows symptoms of changes in the brain that will lead to, to Alzheimer's? Can you measure uh, evidence of plaques or tangles in the cerebral spinal fluid in the spinal column? Can you image the brain? and see these changes. That's where a huge research is on right now. We don't even know if that, even if you could give the drugs early, whether that'll work. There's a really fantastic, fantastically interesting experiment going on in Colombia right now with a, a large extended family, many of whom have the genes for early onset. So they are gonna get Alzheimer's. These people, have a particularly severe form. They start to become demented in their 40s and they usually die by the time they're 55. So many of them now are on a program to start anti-plaque drugs when they're in their late 20s. It's been going for a couple, a couple or three years, something like that. So it's a little bit too soon to know, but if that turns out, that will be an encouraging sign. Still not definitive because that's early onset and while most of the time you assume that's the same as late onset, it might be different in some of the details. So that's where we stand right now in terms of we're exploring how to make better the treatment that looks at, tries to eliminate plaques and tangles. But there are lots of other ideas, I don't want to overwhelm you with uh, examples, but I just want to give you some examples of that. And I borrowed that term from Netflix, Stranger Things. So, herpes viruses. There's been a great deal of attention paid over the last five years to findings that in brain tissue of people who have died of Alzheimer's disease, you find often plenty of herpes viruses. Now, is this a cause or is this just a correlation or is this um, the fact that a diseased brain is unable to resist the incursion of viruses of many kinds? There are some people who are quite convinced that a, a serious issue is infection and if it isn't herpes viruses, oh by the way this guy Leslie Norens, um, formed something called GermQuest. He's offering a million dollar prize. So if APRI's funding runs out, <laughs> you gotta prove, you gotta, to win the million bucks, you gotta prove that an infectious agent causes Alzheimer's. So I think that million bucks is safe for quite a while. But it's representative of the fact that there are these other ways of thinking now. 
and more recently, and you may have heard this about a month ago, a paper was published either suggesting or showing, depending on how much you want to believe, that the bacteria that are involved in gum disease, gingivitis, uh, have been found in the brain. Their protein products seem to be toxic to neurons. Uh, and some uh, reputable science magazines, like New Scientist, actually said, is this the cause of Alzheimer's disease? There's, you know, there's just not enough evidence to call it the cause. But it would be worthwhile brushing your teeth. <laughs> I mean, what have you got to lose? Um, I suspect it's not a cause, but it's just representative of the kind of thinking uh, that's going on. And I already answered that question. Yes, I'm going to finish with this. It's always good to finish with good news. So. Over the past decade, or a bit more, there have been several studies from developed countries, particularly Europe and North America, showing that the incidence, that is the new number of new cases of Alzheimer's per, let's say, 100,000 people, is dropping. Uh, the, one of the clearest studies was from the Framingham Heart Study, which was started in the late 40s. Thousands of people are involved in this. Their health is checked every year. Uh, in the late 70s, a group was looked at. The rate of uh, dementia in that group was, I think, 3.2%. 10 years later, it was 2.8%. 10 years later, which is now the end of the uh, 20th century, 2.2%. The last group was looked at uh, 2009, 2010, it was 2%. So really, from 3.2% to 2%, that's huge. There are many questions. Uh, is this going to hold in other countries? Is it universal? What is causing it? Wh what, despite everything I've said and the numbers that we've heard, what could possibly be allowing the rate of new cases to decline? And by the way, the rate of new cases could decline, but with the growing population of older people, the numbers could still go up. So in most of these studies, two things have been identified, but they're a bit slippery because it's not clear. One is education, again, correlation with how far you went in school. And the other is improved uh, treatment for heart conditions of varying kinds. Stroke treatment, uh, prevention of heart attacks, and all of those. Because there, as I showed you in the list of things that uh, to that might mitigate, one is to control your high blood pressure. So that's been done much better in those countries in the last 20 or 30 years. Um, there is another dementia called vascular, where the cause of the dementia is the accumulation of small bleeds or small strokes over time. And there's a quite large segment of Alzheimer's patients who also have vascular dementia. So you can see that if you improve the treatment, if you get people on better meds, you slow down the rate of clotting in their bodies and their brains, you might see some improvement. But it's still a little bit early to be absolute. And some of these surveys have not been able to identify a factor. And if you take the historian's approach, um, you might argue that, yeah, well, that's what's happening now. But then other factors like uh, obesity, drug use, other things that might come on might raise it again. So I think it's a little bit too early to be super optimistic about this, but that is the good news for today. So thank you very much. You've been a great audience. I really appreciate it. Okay, thank you very much, Jay. And uh, I'd like to invite the members of the panel uh, to come up onto the stage. And I'd also like to introduce, um, come on up, Kevin. Come on up, Roger. I'd like to introduce um, Sherry Remus, who's the regional lead uh, for community relations for the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and the Northwest Territories, who will moderate the panel session. 
Thank you very much, Robert. Good afternoon. As Robert said, I'm Sherry Remus. I am the regional lead of community relations at the Alzheimer's Society here in Lethbridge. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Canadian Centre for Behavioral Neuroscience Brain Awareness event. This is going to be the panel discussion part of it. And just before we get going with introductions, I'd like to give just a few ground rules to everybody. Um, we have placed two microphones, one on each end, over there and over there, for you to come up and ask questions if you feel comfortable doing so. If you do not want to come up and do that, we do have a table here. Please be feel free to go up, write a question um, on the sheet. Those will be brought to me, and then I will um, ask those questions on your behalf. Well, if you are asking a question, I would ask that you give your name briefly. You ask if you want the question directed to a specific person, and then I would like you to ask your question, but keep it brief. This is a question and answer period, not a time to pontificate. <laughs> now, what I'd like to do is um, start by introducing our five panel members, and I will start with my immediate right here. I'd like to introduce Dr. Robert Sutherland. He's the chair of the Department of Neuroscience at the University of Lethbridge. Next to him, of course, is Jay Ingram. And Jay is a Canadian author, science broadcaster, and presenter. And we just had a wonderful presentation from him. Thank you. Um, I would like to introduce next to him is Dr. Ke Kevin Kehoe. He is the executive director of the Alberta Prion um, Research Institute. Next to him is, oh, you moved. Oh, <laughs> you moved on me. <laughs> we're, we're just trying to keep um, you on your My apologies, toes, okay. Right? Okay, next to Jay is, um, I did not see that, my, my apologies, uh, is Roger Marple. Roger is a dementia advocate who talks about battling stigma and living well with the disease himself. Um, and then next to him, of course, is Kevin Keel. And then after that is Brenda Hill. Brenda is the manager of client services at the Alzheimer's Society here in Lethbridge. So first off, I want to ask all the audience here, um, with a show of hands, how many of you know somebody with a diagnosis of dementia? Put your hands up, nice and high. Now that's an awful lot of people. One thing I wanted to give you a quick stat on before we get going. Now three out of four of you will be affected by dementia in some way. I want you to look at the person to your left. I want you to look at the person to your right, say hello. <laughs> One of you will know somebody with dementia. One of you will be a caregiver for somebody with dementia, and one of you will have dementia. So those are some pretty frightening odds. So let's start now um, um, to the panel. What is the biggest challenge in diagnosing Alzheimer's disease and other dementias at the moment? Dr. S Dr. Sutherland? I think that um, Jay really put his finger on an important problem. And it's that um, most of the methods we have right now for detecting the changes in the brain that are related to Alzheimer's disease, by the time we can measure them in the brain, it's really too late to apply any of the prevention steps that we know exist. So we know with the methods we have now, we can probably prevent about one in three cases of Alzheimer's disease. But that requires, in order to apply it in a very effective way, identifying who is likely to develop Alzheimer's disease. And I think that the biomarker approach, uh, where you are looking at molecules in blood or in brain fluid, or perhaps even imaging molecules in the brain, is going to have to advance uh, to the point where before the damage is done, we can actually see that the disease is about to begin. Um, what, how, how does funding affect your ability to do your research? For both of you, um, for Dr. Kevin, how was that affected? Well, is it, I think this is on, I hope it's on, is it on? Yeah. Well, it, it is really extremely difficult in this day and age to be an investigator who just decides, yeah, I'm gonna go and find out about these things. Uh, doing research is quite expensive. 
uh, doing it well and correctly is even more expensive. It's easy to go off and answer a question and get an answer that has absolutely no meaning whatsoever. So it is important that there be available money to allow for the right kinds of questions to be asked in the right way. As I pointed out earlier, the government of Alberta has been supporting some of this type of research, and that's really important. Uh, the government of Canada supports research like that. The Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and Northwest Territories supports research like that. Uh, and more and more money is becoming available. The challenge, I think, really is, one, asking the right kinds of questions. What questions do you ask when you're 30, of a, someone who's 30 years old? And how do you ask them? And how many do you have to ask to find the right sort of answer? And that's not a trivial thing to be able to do. So the, the, the real challenge is having enough money. The other thing is making sure the money is reasonably well invested. And one of the things that we do is we do try to do really good due diligence on people's ideas about what they're going to do. Now sometimes they can be a little far out, but what we want to know is, is there a chance that this type of approach will actually lead to an answer to the question that they're trying to deal with? Lots of people design stuff that's not very well designed, and so you can never get a proper answer. So when we do due diligence with your money, because it's taxpayers' money, we're always looking for that. So it's like all of these other areas. There are always more questions to be asked, so there's always a resort. There's a need for resources. But it's a lot better than it used to be. And that's the positive news. Dr. Sutherland, would you like to add something to that? I just want to make uh, one point. In addition to making sure that we do our due diligence to make sure that excellent, promising research gets funded uh, and that work be uh, peer-reviewed, it's also important to make sure we're making the investments in the right area where it matters. And one of the things that has been calculated uh, is that the cost to Canadian healthcare systems of age-related dementias is more than the combination of the cost of cancer and heart disease. But we're not making the investment in proportion to that cost. And, and what we can see is payoff in cancer we can cure many forms of cancer. We can see that we can cure and prevent many forms of heart disease. We can't yet do that for dementias. Um, this one's for um, Jay. Um, you mentioned in your, um, your speech about all the different mitigating factors that can um, lead to a, um, a diagnosis of dementia. So what happens to the person who's 65 years old, they have bacon every day. They never exercise. They uh, like to watch Netflix all night. Do you have an answer for them? It's always hard to discourage people from eating bacon. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, so this is one of the issues that's not directly related to research. Uh, might have a funding implication. But, you know, how many, there are 350 of you here. I got a chance to mention some of these things to you. Some of you will take them seriously, hopefully. But it's getting the word out to everybody and also convincing younger people that there actually is a life past 30. <laughs> and, and, and I'm serious about this. Like, If I was going to answer the first question, I'd really like to know what is it about the 12-year-old to 20-year-old brain that in some people is already predisposed to dementia 60 years later. Because not only would that get a leg up on some, you know, maybe treatments, but also would convince the entire population, including young people, that this is important to think about. So, I mean, the 55-year-old, what can I say? I mean, it's, um, people, st people have generally stopped smoking, not completely, but you know, there's been huge inroads. Um, we'll see. I mean, it just takes time to get on the, the public agenda. Thank you. We have Good. a question over here to my uh, left. Yes? Hi, my name is Kendall Gibson. Uh, I'm 
I'm just wondering if you've heard of uh, Susan Delamonte's uh, research on diabetes of the brain and it's tied to Alzheimer's and if you could care to comment on that? Any one of you? Well, well, I can give you the superficial view and then somebody like Rob can give you the real science. Um, so uh, she calls uh, Alzheimer's uh, type 3 diabetes and there is a disruption of <coughs> insulin processing in the brain in Alzheimer's. Um, and you know, I, I think it's perhaps a little bit too early to be able to evaluate the overall importance of this, not only this information, but how you would treat it compared to the pursuit of eliminating plaques and tangles. But it's a it is a legitimate point of view that uh, there is insulin disruption. Uh, it probably plays some kind of role, but you know, again, Rob and I were talking earlier about the idea of infectious agents like viruses or bacteria. They may play a role too, but it's sorting through how many of these things play a small role, uh, how many of them play, how many look like they play a role, but in fact are coincident. You know, there was this big fuss that I'm sure many of you remember about aluminum. Uh, you should never, like don't boil rhubarb in an aluminum pot. You'll be, you'll have dementia the next day. Uh, <laughs> But, um, you know, there, there is aluminum found in plaques, but that doesn't mean they caused them. There's correlation and there's causation, and they're different. Did you want to add to that? Yeah, I'll make one point. Um, I find the topic interesting enough that we, we have one project ongoing in my laboratory, uh, by that person standing at the back, uh, to try to evaluate the significance uh, of this as a factor um, I think that um, uh, people often, when they identify a factor, uh, it turns out either to be just a curious correlation, as Jay described, or it may contribute to some of the risk. Uh, but frequently, they overblow the import of individual risk factors that may only contribute one or two percent. Um, and I think that may very well be the case uh, with the um, this topic that was brought up. Could um, I just point out something about the, co the correlation and causation? We, we often in science see correlations and they're quite legitimate. They're done by reliable people who have made these observations. But I think it's really important to remember that they don't necessarily tell us why that correlation is present. And until we can take the next step or the next steps, sort of say, well, why would that be happening? What's going on in the body, in the, in the brain, in the cells that's causing that correlation to be present or to, to show up? We can't deal with it other than you can say, well, eat better, you know, because that's not a bad thing. But it doesn't help you with getting to a root cause. And that's one of the things that, for example, the Alberta Prion Research Institute supports is when people take the next step and say, okay, we are aware of these correlations. Now can we figure out what it is that might be behind that so that you can then figure out how you might deal with it if it's a legitimate, as opposed to, there are, the, there's the old story about, you know, the incidence of cancer is usually higher in places that have more television sets than not. But that's not, it doesn't mean anything in a correlation, but there are, there are correlations that are quite legitimate too that they've been, the science that associates the correlation is, is quite legitimate, but it doesn't give us an explanation that goes with it. The most recent one that I have heard you might be interested in is if you have a stroke and you're older, you're better off if you're obese. <laughs> and, and people say, well, the, the data is there and it's obvious. The question is, well, why would that be? And that needs to be now explored much further. The general explanation right now is there's an energy reserve of fat that you can rely on to recover from the, the stroke. That's as good as you can do right now, but that may not be the explanation. So okay. we have to be careful of some of the, doesn't mean that they're not real, but they may not help us understand the root cause. It may be much more indirect. Okay, that doesn't mean you should be going out and eating all these McDonald burgers now, folks. No, I'm not encouraging that, but you, <laughs> eating well is not a bad thing to do. <laughs> yes, we have another question to my uh, left, sir. 
Hi, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, Jay mentioned the failure of many clinical trials in the past decade or so, very disappointing clinical trials that we've had on Alzheimer's disease and uh, treatments for Alzheimer's disease. Could you speak to the impact this has had on uh, how clinical trials are now being done to treat Alzheimer's and if there's anything that needs to change about the rigor of science that we're basing these clinical trials on or the honesty of that science, um, doing registered experiments or just how this has had an impact on way cl the ways clinical trials are being done? That's like six questions. <laughs> So can I summarize the question by saying the fa how the failure has impacted the sort of present and future of research? Okay. Um, well, I mean, I, if you're a researcher, it's given you lots of opportunities. Uh, but, you know, it's not a good thing that these... Here, there's one really significant reason why the failure of clinical trials, and it's almost complete, you know, almost every clinical trial and, and some of them were incredibly frustrating because the drug actually succeeded in the goal, which was to reduce the amount of plaque, but people continued to become more and more cognitively impaired while that was happening. And that, in fact, has uh, sparked some skepticism about the role of plaques, but there are many reasons that that could have been the case. It might, nobody, I mean, there are people that think that plaques actually are good in the sense that they represent a sort of collection of what are really the most toxic entities, which are much smaller than the plaques, and that if you were to bust plaques up, you might just worsen the situation. But drug companies uh, are losing enthusiasm because they invest millions, if not billions, into new drugs. And uh, when they don't work, that's just money down the drain and there are probably easier fish to fry than dementia in your drug development program. And one is post, one company's just pulled out of the anti-Alzheimer's drug business. So that's, you know, that's all driven by shareholders and stuff like that, but that's one less company that's encouraging research to try and develop new drugs. Um, on the other hand, that's how it works, right? I mean, early on in treatments, and I would argue we're kind of early on, um, failures are inevitable. And what they do is they, I mean, I guess the positive side is they make people, researchers, uh, funders more determined to get the right answers. But right now, I would say, if you're still talking about plaques and tangles, a la Alzheimer himself, I still think that's the main dish on the table. Um, and the, the first really strong approach will be somehow figure out how to get the markers so you can give them earlier. If that fails, then I think we're into a new ballgame. Hmm. I have one more to my left, and then I'm going to take some questions that were submitted. Yes, sir. Um, I have actually three questions in one. Um, when we're looking at prevention versus treatment, obviously the dollar follows the treatment rather than prevention. Um, is there any way that you can change that focus? Or is it just the dollars that sponsor the research focuses more on the treatment rather than looking at prevention? And when we look at prevention, I'm reading an article from Bill Gates. Uh, one of his biggest um, projects right now is Alzheimer's as well. And he had mentioned that there is one uh, first generation of theory that goes back to the proteins. And they found that there were two proteins, the amyloid and the tau. I'm not pronouncing the last one correctly, obviously. Um, that is the result of causing those plaques. So if we look at preventing the plaques by reducing those pro proteins in our diet or in our society, is that uh, still a theory that can be pursued? Is it being pursued? Um, and then my final one goes back to um, Alzheimer's now is getting a lot more data and they're trying to figure out how to use that data. But one of the challenges that we have is to reduce, uh, to increase more patients uh, for the treatments and the trials. Uh, how can that be uh, better um, or more efficient to, to increase the people that can take part in the trials. <laughs> so I'll, I'll make a comment about the second question uh, first. Um, so the two proteins that you talked about are the proteins that cause the plaques and tangles that Jay described. Um, th these proteins are actually normal 
uh, important um, physiologically significant molecule in a normal brain. What, what happens is um, because of a process that we don't understand very well, they become misfolded and aggregate in unusual ways. Um, and, and the genes that are linked to Alzheimer's disease uh, are critical in pushing these proteins into an abnormal um, folded shape. And so there's nothing in principle wrong with the molecules per se, and so eliminating them from diet or finding some way to uh, uh, not have them in your brain uh, is not going to be the answer. Um, perhaps coming up with ways of changing the, the shape, the folding of these things uh, might work or actually eliminating the misfolded ones entirely through a vaccination or some other approach uh, might work. And I think the, the third question that you asked, is there some way we can increase uh, patients in clinical trials? Um, I've just recently had some experience in trying to recruit patients into a clinical trial, uh, looking for Alzheimer's patients um, uh, with a blood pressure medication that seems to clear amyloid. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, uh, it, it's actually uh, been ongoing for about a year, and we haven't had any uh, physician um, provide us with an Alzheimer's patient yet. Um, so recruitment through primary care docs um, is very, very slow. These are the same problems they're having in Calgary and in Toronto. Uh, and researchers can't go out and directly find the patients. It's family doctors that identify people who would be best served by some of these treatments. So why is that happening? Are they, are they, do the family docs not know that you're looking for people? I think you'd have to ask um, the family docs. <laughs> that's and I think uh, for me that's one of the misconceptions. I think many people with Alzheimer's, and Roger, I'll put this over to you, but or dementia would be more than happy to uh, participate in research. However, when you're looking at credible research and research that is going to then eventually um, make some some change, and that's Dr. Rove, but um, there are many, many uh, things that have to be put in place so that the efficacy of that research is correct and people can rely on it. And so I think it's, you know, communication, it's definitely awareness, uh, and it's the wherewithal, because all of this costs a great deal of money, and in order to support the research uh, for actual patient kinds of clinical trials, and uh, I don't know if Alan was talking about those kinds of things, but, um, you know, it's, it's a very complicated issue, and uh, Roger, I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn, but I'm sure many people would participate if they knew what they were participating in. Roger, what would you like to add to that? Well, I, actually, um, I've been through an actual drug study. Uh, it was a double-blind placebo, uh, as most uh, studies are. Um, and at the time, it was called the Steadfast Study. Uh, and the idea of the drug at the time, it was supposed to help with your cognitive abilities and hopefully increase uh, years of quality of life. So I, I do know the rigidness uh, behind this study, and it's very rigid. Uh, so, so the collecting of data, that kind of thing. But um, I was also at the National Dementia Strategy um, recently, actually, mm -hmm. in Ottawa. I, I, you, a lot of you people probably heard about it. I was invited to go. And that's a sticking point uh, with the research community and people with dementia. There's a, uh, people with dementia want to be involved and researchers want people with dementia. So there's a bit of a disconnect, in my opinion, in Canada. So just one thing, um, I'm heavily involved with Alzheimer's Canada. I'm on a research policy committee there. I've even reviewed biomedical and quality of life research uh, proposals and, and also being on this committee. 
But something on the cards with Alzheimer's Canada uh, is, and I, I'm thinking this will be in the near future, is they want to create a hub that, uh, for example, if Dr. Sutherland is doing a study, uh, he would, uh, and it's got to pass all the ethics and all the criteria behind it, not just anybody can reach out and look for people <coughs> with dementia. There's a very strict protocol uh, when it comes to research proposals. But it, if the research proposal passes the criteria, uh, they can go to Alzheimer's Canada and say, hey, listen, I'm doing a study on this. And it passed all the ethics, everything's good, it's in place. Their hope is to create a hub, a connection between people with dementia and researchers to help facilitate their uh, research. And Kevin, you wanted to add? Yeah, not to that specific point, but to come back to something that Jay said about the issue of drug trial failures and what some of the consequences are. Uh, I was, I'm, I'm, not, I'm <coughs> not an Alzheimer's researcher. My background is on stuff that helps keep your lungs open. Mm -hmm. uh, and in 1967, there were two clinical trials that failed to treat young, premature babies who didn't have this material. And then everybody went back and said, okay, we don't think that the general target is wrong but we're obviously approaching it the wrong way around. So what can we do? And I think what's happened with the trials, and Jay alluded to this, is it invigorates the scientists, and eventually the drug companies will come back, okay, to think about, okay, how do we approach this differently, and what can we do? And I can tell you by 1987, there was then a treatment available for pre premature babies, but it did take some time to get the companies over it, the doctors over it, and the basic scientists moving along to the point where they said, yeah, this, is, this can be done. I think this is gonna happen in Alzheimer's too. That's the good news part. There's another example of, um, there was, uh, at the beginning of this century, there was a thought that um, perhaps one of the reasons more women get Alzheimer's than men is that after menopause, estrogen levels fall, and estrogen is known to be neuroprotective. So there were two or three big studies carried on where postmenopausal women were given estrogen replacement and they didn't work. And in fact, they compromised the health of some of the women in that study. The women in that study were all 65 and older. Menopause average age is 52 to 53. It hasn't changed with that whole life expectancy thing. And there are a lot of people who think if we had done the same sort of thing that is being contemplated with Alzheimer's drugs, given estrogen replacement, that immediately after menopause, it might have had an effect. But enthusiasm for that was so dampened by these results that those new studies have not taken place yet, and that's <laughs> coming on to 20 years. Um, I have a question for Roger. Roger, one from the audience. How do you live well with Alzheimer's, both as a person with the disease and as a caregiver? So you can speak about part of that. Well, as far as the caregiver, I'm single. Uh, I live alone, uh, so I am the caregiver. But how do you live well with uh, Alzheimer's? Yeah, you know, something, a message I keep pounding away at, uh, right, right from the beginning is, the narrative, um, my experience is the narrative behind Alzheimer's or, or any form of dementia, quite often it's a sad narrative. And quite often the conversation goes to the end stages of the disease. And, and uh, that's a horse we've beaten pretty well to death. And it's important to talk about end of days with dementia, but it's 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 equally important to speak about uh, when you're in the functional stages as well. Uh, so uh, something I do constantly is, is, is try to let people know. And, and you, the different faces of dementia, beginning, middle, end. So you all have your perceptions of where you're at with this disease. So I'm speaking from my 
perception where I'm at in the here and now. And uh, I, I always try to let people know that it's possible to live well with dementia regardless of the challenges you may be having, memory issues, uh, being confused, bad days, good days, bad hours, good hours. I, I, I'd even go so far to say that. But uh, there's uh, pretty cool advice. Um, Jay mentioned the MIND diet. Um, I can remember my doctor, uh, I'm going to see her. She grabbed that very book threw it down on her desk and she says, Roger, you got to buy this. She talks me into all sorts of things for living well. <laughs> she's really cool. And I don't want to be at uh, the receiving end when she's upset with me if I say I'm going to do something and I don't, holy cow. You, you don't want to be on the receiving end of that. But uh, she, she grabbed the book and she threw it down. She goes, this is the Mind Diet. I use this book myself. Rebecca Krantz is the author. And she goes, it's really cool. It tells you what foods are good for your cognitive abilities and also some downright delicious recipes in there. Because you tell people with dementia, uh, you got to eat healthy. Well, what the hell does that mean? <laughs> right? You know? And, and, and you got to make it fun. You got to make it interesting. You got to hand them a cookbook. Right? Uh, you, you know, that kind of thing. So anyway, I go buy this cookbook and it's really cool. So I... I do feel good from eating well. Exercise is another thing. She goes, I want you to do um, cardio one day, cardio one day, and w uh, weight training the next. And then she takes the study, slides it across. She always packs it up with uh, research. Everything she gives me, she'll follow up with, a, here's the research on it. So she said these exercises specifically help you live well with dementia. Great. Off to the gym I go. Um, my worst enemy uh, is idle time, doing nothing. I think one of the, the most important things, or at least for me, is exercising your brain. And I'm not talking just crossword puzzles here. I, I, I write blogs every month. Um, I've done numerous public speaking. I've done interviews with media, and, and that's what keeps you sharp. When you're sitting around doing nothing, uh, that's when I feel declines very quickly. You know, so one of the most important things in my mind, you got to eat well, you got to exercise, that's all common sense, but you really got to work the needle. Um, uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's tons of things I do to live well, but the big thing is I live life. I love to travel, so I travel. I, I, I love to have fun. I shamelessly chase fun, <laughs> right? Shamelessly. <laughs> you know, there was a food and beverage show in town. Woohoo! let's go. <laughs> Try some cool wine. Uh, yeah, but get out, live life, have fun, and do it for as long as you can. Roger, um, you talked about writing for different things, and I, cr I recently read um, an article that you wrote for the Early Onset Dementia Alberta Foundation's newsletter, and it was about language, and you mentioned dementia sufferer spe specifically. Why do you like that, dislike that term so much? Well, okay, uh, backing up just a bit, I hate stigma, and I hate it with a passion. I don't like... Uh, uh, the negativity that comes with it. I don't like jokes on Facebook. I bet you if I said, anyone who peruses Facebook, you would be hard pressed not to have seen an Alzheimer's joke. How many people here have seen an Alzheimer's joke on public media of some kind? Newspaper, <laughs> Facebook, that kind of thing. Anyway, it's a pet hate of mine. Uh, so I argue that quite often. But uh, uh, language is very important. Uh, uh, what you say, uh, challenge jokes on public media, that type of thing. We need to change the trends. Uh, but, you know, uh, dementia suffer, as you asked. Uh, I can remember I did an interview for Global Canada uh, when I was in British Columbia. And a friend saved the clip of the interview and emailed it to me. And I'm watching myself speak. And, and this happens over and over and over again. 
where I'm, I'm watching myself speak on the interview on the news clip, and then my name, you know how on, when someone speaks on TV, their name comes underneath it? Well, my name comes up, and below that it said dementia sufferer. Right? And I go, oh, Jesus. You know, the last thing I want is to be portrayed as a victim or have people look at me with pity. So I, I personally don't like that. Can, you, can the word suffer be used? Of course it can. And there is people, especially at the end stages, uh, that suffer with dementia. But I think we should leave that description up to either me living with dementia or, or family members and friends who live with this disease as much as we do, not for the media, right? So ever since that day, every time I do a, an interview for any type of media, newspaper, TV, I make it a point to say, don't describe me as a dementia sufferer. You can say living with dementia. You can say diagnosed with dementia, Alzheimer's in my case, but don't don't call me a sufferer. That's not for you to generalize. And I always advise people, if you're speaking in general about people with dementia, yeah, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't use the word suffer unless you're actually speaking from that point of view. Um, and, and the other day I did an interview uh, just in this last week for a newspaper, and I forgot to mention it, as you may Imagine I have issues with memory, and I forgot to say, hey, by the way, don't call me a dementia sufferer. Uh, sure as <laughs> crap. <laughs> dementia sufferer is in the headline, you know? So uh, people need to, um, especially the public media, if you're out there, you know, just fight that urge to, to say that. Um, Thanks. Thanks. No, yeah. Brenda. Um, <laughs> I've had quite a few people write in uh, questions that have, have to do with um, caregiving, and I'm going to read them out, and then we'll try to paraphrase how you want to answer this. So I've got one that says, how do you get a loved one to visit the doctor if you suspect dementia without upsetting or alienating them? How do you determine when someone with dementia should go into extended care? And um, another one says, I am 38 years old with a mother who has stage 7 Alzheimer's disease at age of 66. What would be your one recommendation for me at this time of my life? So there's a lot of different people worried about, um, you know, um, getting the care that people need. Well, I would say one of the things that um, I'm quite vocal about, and people often don't like me, uh, even sometimes my own family doesn't like me for this. But I think if you're having issues with cognition, with your health, with problems, somebody needs to take the person to see a medical professional. I'm not a medical professional. But somebody needs to drag that person to a doctor or have a good, frank conversation with that person about the issues or the the things that they're seeing in their home. I, um, my colleagues and I at the, at the Alzheimer's Society uh, will be happy to sit down and have that conversation with you and, and the person, uh, your loved one. We, we do that on a regular basis. Um, as well, um, for the next part, if you're looking at someone that young with a, with a I'm thinking close to end stage of Alzheimer's disease, if you're talking, I know some people uh, do stages one to eight. Um, I think, uh, again, uh, you have to look at uh, the assessment of the person with dementia. You have to look at the physician's assessment of that. Uh, we always want to get make sure the medical people are involved as a caregiver. If you are feeling totally stressed and uh, feeling some of the, uh, the effects of that, which can be devastating um, to your own health, uh, it's really important that you see a doctor and that you um, take some steps for your own personal health. Caregivers can often get to a point where their health is really on uh, a risky, risky slope. 
And I've said, I mean, uh, because I um, try and be a plain speaker, I say to people who are at the uh, caring for someone with dementia who's at the very late stages of the disease and they're caring for them at home, that, you know, there are some serious consequences for not seeking appropriate help, help, help and help. Um, I had uh, seen caregivers who have ended up with, with heart, a fatal ha heart attack or uh, health crisis, who have had to be uh, taken to a hospital in ambulance and the person with dementia is left behind. Um, you know, you want to be planning these things and like looking after everyone involved uh, in Alzheimer's and uh, caring for someone with Alzheimer's. Thank you. Uh, we have a question over here. Yes, lady, uh, ma'am. Hello. There, is that better? Um, I was just wondering, when you refer to early onset, at what age are you looking at, like what makes that different from late onset? And is it treated any differently than, than the normal late onset of dementia? So, um, So, <laughs> sorry, I've been thinking about the mind diet and thinking that skip the dishes and U Uber Eats should be co-opted to give discounts if people order mind diet meals. So maybe there's a funding opportunity there somewhere. Sorry, uh, I know that wasn't your question. Um, so I, I um, Rob may be able to refine this a bit, but generally speaking, early 50s, uh, would be a typical familial early onset uh, case. Um, as far as I know, and I'm, you know, you could enlighten me on the caregiving, but I think the caregiving aspect is pretty much the same. I don't know whether the course is more rapid, but the course of Alzheimer's varies uh, quite significantly uh, among people as well. Um, so yeah, but I mean, early 50s generally, and so it's, you know, other than maybe some ambiguous cases in the 60s where it might not be immediately obvious, have you passed the cutoff and are you now into late onset? But generally, it's, I think it's fairly clear what you're dealing with. Anybody? If I could just add a, a little bit. Um, it turns out that exactly the same proteins, the two abnormal proteins are involved in early onset and late onset. Um, the only difference is that the the accumulation of plaque, the abnormal amyloid protein, occurs much earlier in early onset, but from the time that starts building up until the end point of the disease, it's exactly the same amount of time as in uh, late onset. Um, so the disease goes through its course earlier in that person's life, um, but there seems to be the same kind of process. Um, we don't know what the real triggers are in the case of um, late onset, but the um, three mu mutations in two genes that Jay talked about, we know that is the trigger for the abnormal proteins. Otherwise, they seem to be the same disease. There is something to be said about the, the course of late onset related to the whole education piece, um, because in, in the face of not being able to define exactly what education does for you, that's good, uh, people have labeled it brain reserve or cognitive reserve. The idea being that somebody who has an extensive education and maybe did well on intelligence tests when they were young can absorb or withstand a larger load of plaque in their brain before they start to decline cognitively. And so you, you might have two cases, one where um, the, they don't have the education advantage and the plaque builds up and they decline like this, and somebody else has the advantage, they go like that, but when they hit the point where they can no longer override the accumulation of plaque, they descend more rapidly and the end result is pretty much the end, both people end up at the same place at the same time. And I know I've read that there are people with early onset that are getting it in their mid-30s. So there are cases of people in their 30s and 40s who get early onset. But Roger, how old were you when you were diagnosed? Um, yeah, I'd be described as early onset. And uh, how old? 57. 57. 
So, yeah. Yeah, I, you know, uh, just stuff I've read on your website and Alzheimer's Canada, but if you're looking for a dividing line uh, between early onset and regular diagnosis of dementia, I think if you're below 65, uh, as a rule, that's your rule of thumb to describe it as early onset or it's still Alzheimer's with vascular components is my actual diagnosis. Um, you mentioned people uh, had that. That's, that's yeah, that's my case. So I don't know. I, I That early onset thing, I think it just means you're getting younger, right? It doesn't yeah. really change your diagnosis. Am I correct? No. Yeah. So I have a couple questions here for whoever wants to try to answer them, and they're to do with um, different reasons for getting, perhaps getting dementia. I'll read both of them out. One of them is on brain injury. Does age of person's brain injury affect chances of dementia, and which area of the brain injury would play a role? And the other one is, can you touch on the relationship between the anesthetic and Alzheimer's? So I'm not sure who would like to touch on those. Well, I, I think it would be really hard to be able to identify what part of the brain uh, would be most significant uh, to predispose you to dementia after brain injury. And uh, I don't know about age. Uh, again, it's, you know, the problem is honestly gathering information in, in just about every respect of this disease, every aspect of this disease. And, um, you know, brain, I mean, it's like general anesthetic. What if you had three when you were 12? I don't think we have enough cases to be able to draw any conclusions about that. You know, it's like brushing your teeth. It's always good to, av if whenever possible, avoid traumatic brain injury. And obviously, slipping on the ice and getting a concussion, you're not going to wear a bicycle helmet to the grocery store, <laughs> I don't think. But, um, you know, there are ways that you can protect yourself that would be sensible otherwise. And I, I think the whole diet thing is like that. It's not that you should eat that range of food to prevent dementia, it's just generally better for you in almost every respect. And so those are the things that I think are probably going to be the easiest to promote. Things that, you know, because people will have, uh, you talked about stigma, you know, people will have a, a bit of a stigma about doing something to prevent dementia just because they don't like the idea of it. Whereas if you can sell it as this is a just a sensible way to live your life, I think it'd be better. Kevin? There is a, a, a one thing about the way in which some of these diseases, I suspect all of them, but at different stages, develop physically in the brain. And if you get brain injury, it may well depend on when you get it and how severe it is. And people, remember there are two proteins that are potentially bad proteins in Alzheimer's, and the plaque tends to form earlier, as Jay sh showed you, than the other protein that's called tau. And tau particularly develops, you can see it regionally develop over time in the brain. A, a beta plaque tends to occur faster earlier than maybe it probably develops like that too. But it may well be that if you get concussed or you get bad brain injury at different times, you may have an effect on that. We know that very serious brain injury probably leads to something called chronic traumatic encephalopathy that you find the, the, the famous movie about the football player. Uh, it, 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 so the timing of when this happens and how severe it is may have a very important impact on this. And again, as Jay, Jay just said, we just don't have enough data at this point to be able to explain that very well, except the fact that we know that it's one of the risk factors for Alzheimer's and maybe some other dementias. I have a question over here to my right, ma'am. Ask this question here so I don't go home and Google it. Um, plaques and wrinkles. Oh, before, is there a brain that doesn't have plaques and tangles in it? Is it something that is like, if you have plaques and tangles, uh, do you understand what I'm saying? Is, is it a, an amount of plaques and tangles that causes dementia, or is it just? that being in the brain. So I'll take a crack at this first and, and anyone else can weigh in. But uh, the emergence of some amount of 
plaque and tangle is something you see in every brain over time. The older a person gets, and all of us are doing this right now, the more we accumulate abnormal uh, plaque and tangle. Now, uh, it depends exactly on other factors about the brain. For example, education is something that Jay emphasized. You can have the same level of plaque and tangle, and it can be quite high, but you could show no cognitive symptoms at all, no memory problems. Um, the same level in a person with very low cognitive reserve or education, and you could end up seeing something that would qualify uh, as Alzheimer's type dementia. Um, some of the genes that are risk factors uh, that aren't very strong factors probably affect how much the abnormal proteins will produce trouble in the brain. Um, and so I think that's an important uh, uh, consideration. It's also likely the case that not all abnormal proteins are the same. It might turn out that there's different species of amyloid beta that are differently toxic to the brain. And we're just beginning to sort of peel back that little bit of uh, hidden information about amyloid plaques. So it's normal. We can't use the presence as a diagnosis uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, I think that's the answer. There was a famous, there was a famous study called the Nun Study. Mm -hmm. They recruited uh, the, the school sisters of Notre Dame in the US. And uh, the agreement was that uh, they would do a psychological test twice a year and donate their brain when they died. And the, the amazing single individual was a woman named Sister Mary who died at 101. And in the psych test that she, the most recent one she did before she died, she did better than all of her colleagues. Now mind you, her colleagues are all 85 and over, but still she had, um, she was well within normal bounds and her brain was absolutely full of plaques and tangles. And what's curious about Sister Mary in terms of the education piece is that she entered the convent when she was 19 and didn't finish high school diploma until she was 39. So, you know, and, and what Rob just said about different species of plaque and tangle shows that um, it's not actually a, a thing that we talk about much, but this is a fascinated, fascinating area of science. I mean, how is it that 20-year-olds, whatever their brains are like then, influence what their brains are like? The Nun study showed that too. Essays that 19-year-olds wrote explaining why they wanted to join the convent were evaluated for their, the idea density, the number of ideas per sentence. And the higher the idea density when they were 19, predicted a lower risk of dementia when they were in their 80s. And so you have this tremendous lifelong arc of the development of this disease and, you know, we're um, just the research is going full blast, but there's much to learn. Um, is there a question down there? Yes, please. Thank you, Jay Ingram, because um, I listened to Suzuki David and you, and now I forgot his name. He was here. Anyway, I wanted to uh, express that <laughs> nuns are brain stuff. So anyway, sorry, I'm we can't. You have to talk if, closer. If you're if I'm you're talking to me and I have hearing loss, and you, you've got to be on the mic. Thank you. Thank you for being here. That's what I want to say. And I'm, I'm supposed to ask questions, not to say to the, you know, thing majigi. But I wanted to mention that nun's brain, who was clear up here until well above the average age of dying. Anyway, I'm glad you mentioned it. Two weeks ago, I listened to BBC. And there is a doctor, neuroscientist, in Arizona or something, and the one in Europe. For five years, those doctors started to say, plaques are not the cause of dementia, but the way to protect the patient, patients from Alzheimer's. <gasps> anyway, 
Okay, have you read the book, Still Alice? Yes. Oh, good. Yeah, it was done by a neuroscientist from Yale or Harvard. She said, when I present my thesis, PhD thesis, only five, six, seven advisors read, uh, read. So she wrote the book, now it's a bestseller. Anyway, another thing is Rita Hayworth. The singing and the dancing is, are supposed to be good for the brain. How come she got the Alzheimer? <laughs> That's my question to Jay, please. Okay. She wants to know if, uh, if the woman was very smart and had that much education, how she got Alzheimer's disease. And the Rita Hayworth, too. <laughs> she was well, married this is, to this Aga is Khan. A, it's a simple answer. I have no idea. <laughs> I mean, but, but which woman are we talking about? Uh, Rita oh, Hayworth, Rita uh, Aga Khan's you know, uh, okay, so wife. Many highly educated people get Alzheimer's. Many poorly educated people, and I know that's a value judgment, but people who don't go far in school don't get it. People with the genes that should raise their risk, I mentioned earlier, double dose of those genes, don't get it as, m as much as, you know, a significant percentage of them don't. People with no genetic risks get it. This is part of the mystery. It's part of the problem. Um, and, you know, people are just making progress on pieces that they do understand because you can't jump off, uh, like, from here to here on an island of thinking you've got to work your way across. And, there, I mean, there are so many questions we could ask that, I mean, Rob's in the business of asking those questions and trying to do experiments to answer them. Kevin's in the business of, it, of providing funds for people to ask the right questions. But there's way more questions than answers right now. So if you say, why did somebody get it and why did not, somebody else not get it, we just throw up our hands and say, we don't know. Sorry. So I'm sorry. I'll have to move on. Uh, we only have time for one more question. Um, so my apologies to all those who have written in questions. We won't be able to get to any more. This will be the last question for our panel discussion. How much do lifestyle factors influence the decline of an Alzheimer's patient's brain once a diagnosis with illness? Or does it make any difference? Read that again. Okay. How much do lifestyle factors influence the, the decline of an Alzheimer's patient's brain once they have been diagnosed with the illness? How much do lifestyle factors influence that decline? Or do you know? Do you want me to take a kick at it? Um, <laughs> well, you know, I was talking earlier about exercise, diet, all that. I, I think, you know, if you're looking to live well with a disease with, with no cure. You know, something I always point out, we all live with this terminal condition called life, right? We're all going to die. There's no cure for life yet. There's no cure for dementia yet. So what's the difference? The uh, name of the game is to live well for as long as possible, regardless of what our challenges are. And, and our, um, Lifestyle to me is huge. It's like, yeah, there was something someone told me once. They said, why bother get a diagnosis? We're gonna die anyway. Why bother do anything about this disease? We're gonna die anyway. Uh, you know, that's crazy, you know? Uh, embrace those lifestyle changes, do your homework. And if you got something that works for you, do it. Um, uh, but that's a huge part. I mean, a hu probably the most important thing for living well with dementia is, is embracing those lifestyle changes, you know, maybe a better diet, exercise. But I'll tell you, man, uh, you know, I... I would, can I chime in yeah, here, yeah. Roger? I, I just think um, I've known Roger for about four years, known of him. And uh, he started off his, his uh, diagnosis time and started working towards living a better life every day. Uh, I think maybe Jay or, or one of the docs can correct me if I'm wrong, but I always tell people uh, if you've met one person with dementia, you've met one person with dementia. Um, I think Robert states it quite eloquently when he talks about how, and Jay said it as well, how many of those 
precursors of the start of dementia are starting long before we ever identify outside symptoms. Um, so taking care of ourselves, doing the things that we know are not going to harm us, but are going to be better for us, um, is, is certainly, you know, going to make a difference in all of our lives. I, I saw Robert Bob speak a week ago and thought to myself, oh God, the only thing I have protecting myself is my fat. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, I think we all need to really, you know, pay attention to those day-to-day -day signals and what we know, what, what physicians have been telling us. The brain, uh, certainly we're in our infancy knowing how how things work, but we can we can uh, do what we can to have a better quality of life. And uh, I just want to get one more thing off my chest. Um, if if you have loved ones, when when she you mentioned dragging them to the doctor get that diagnosis, I'm living better with dementia than I was before I was diagnosed. I j and and that's just a series of working with your doctor and tweaking medications and eating better, and all of a sudden you find yourself living pretty good with a difficult disease. But I just talked to a lady, and this is something to take home. Um, I was having a talk with a, a group towards dementia, and we're having a good conversation, and this one lady come up to me after the talk, and she goes, yeah, I got to go um, tell my mother her sister just died. And I said, God, I'm so, I'm so sorry to hear that. And, uh, you know, I'm waiting for her to elaborate. And she goes, uh, she thought she had dementia and she never went to the doctor because she thought there's no hope, it's a disease with no cure, that kind of attitude. And finally, when uh, the cognitive issue got so in her face, she went to see a doctor. And you know what the doctor told her? I wish you'd come in earlier. You have a brain tumor. Oh. And if you came in earlier, I could have did something for you, but you waited so long, I'm afraid this is terminal and you have two months to live. So she died. And she had to go explain that to her mother. So, you know, get that diagnosis. You know, so what? You know, if... if if, if you can be put on a path to improve your quality of life for a longer period of time, do that. Uh, so if, if you got family members, they're struggling, you said, man, we should get you in to see a doctor, get them in to see a doctor. Good things happen after that. So if you see the benefits and what good things happen, after getting a diagnosis, it's not a horrible thing, you know, right? Uh, diagnosis of life, diagnosis of dementia. Like I said, we're all going to die. You want to live well for as long as you can for the best you can. So Get you the diagnosis. So what I'm thinking and what I'm hearing is that there is hope after a diagnosis, and Roger is a perfect example of that, don't you think? And, and, well, then when you, sir, one, and then when you take him to the doctor, tell the doctor that Rob is looking for people for his study. <laughs> <laughs> On behalf of the Alzheimer's Society of Alberta and Northwest Territories, I would like to thank all of you guests um, uh, for coming here. I would like to thank the panel guests as well for being a part of this uh, discussion. Um, I'd also like to thank Dr. Sutherland and his team at the Canadian Centre for Behavioural Neuroscience for allowing us, the Alzheimer's Society, to be a part of this whole presentation and the panel. Um, I would like to invite Dr. Sutherland to come up to the podium to just say a few final words. Thank you. Thank you, Sherry. And uh, I'll just add a couple of more thank yous. Um, First, I'd like to thank Institutional Advancement at the University of Lethbridge, particularly Kaylee McKay, for doing a great job in pulling things together. Uh, outstanding. Um, I'd like to thank Jay Ingram in particular, and Roger and Kevin. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank the local Alzheimer's Society uh, of Alberta and Northwest Territories 
for all of their input and enthusiasm for this event. Uh, I think it's great. Final note of thank you. Um, this occurred as a result of a gift uh, from the estate of Harley Hotchkiss. Thank you. So that ends our second portion of the event. Thank you all for coming. I hope you got a lot out of it and have a good evening. <laughs>